I'm very pleased to uh, be able to participate in the uh, uh, centenary uh, celebrations, uh, auspicious occasion, and uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to take part in it. Uh, in discussing uh, problems of the future, there are two issues that are so overwhelming that uh, no uh, uh, approach to these matters can ignore them totally. I'm not going to say much about them. Uh, one is the problem of environmental destruction, uh, which is approaching uh, we see in aspects of it regularly. Uh, the second is the problem of nuclear war, uh, constantly a dark cloud ever since 1945, and the problem is not getting, uh, is not approaching solution. Uh, there were two major conferences last year, international conferences, uh, attempting to address these problems. One in Copenhagen on the environment was a complete failure. Uh, another, the uh, uh, regular nuclear posture review, nuclear proliferation trees review last May, which also got nowhere. Uh, right now, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency is meeting uh, to try to deal with problems of proliferation. You can take a look at this morning's newspaper, you can find that uh, the non-aligned countries uh, for whom Egypt is now uh, is spokesman, uh, they are presenting a, a, a request that the agency uh, uh, demand that Israel, which is a nuclear power but not a member, that Israel open up its nuclear uh, facilities to inspection and join the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, the United States is blocking that a regular process. Uh, the uh, agency is also uh, calling for a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East, which would be a significant step towards uh, reducing the threat of nuclear war. Uh, the U.S. will not permit that to take place. It should be mentioned that the United States and Britain have a special commitment to this beyond other countries. And the reason is that when they invaded Iraq, uh, they attempted to provide a thin legal cover for the uh, uh, invasion. And they appealed to a Security Council resolution in 1991, which called on Iraq to uh, eliminate its weapons of mass destruction, as it turns out they had already done. Uh, and the U.S. and Britain claimed they had not yet done so, therefore the uh, invasion was legal. Nobody took that seriously, but it was a justification. Uh, however, the press has yet to report for commentators that that same resolution uh, calls on uh, uh, all countries to uh, dedicate themselves to establishing a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East which gives the U.S. and Britain a special responsibility in this respect, and they are taking the lead in preventing it from happening. Uh, none of this gets reported, but you can see a little piece of it in this morning's newspaper. The U.S. insisted that the focus of the international agency uh, meetings be on Iran. Uh, in uh, Western policy-making circles and among the political commentators, this year is called the year of Iran, uh, and the Iranian threat is uh, considered to pose the greatest danger to world order, and therefore to be the primary focus of uh, U.S. foreign policy. Uh, Europe is trailing along politely as usual. Well, I'll return to the nature of the Iranian threat as it's officially formulated. Uh, and to what that uh, teaches us about how policies are formulated and implemented and about the efforts to uh, make the future uh, actually teaches us quite a lot, I think. First, some background comments. Uh, while alleged threats come and go, uh, depending on need, 
the basic principles of uh, policy formation are quite stable. Uh, one fundamental principle was outlined by Adam Smith in his uh, 18th century classic, The uh, Wealth of Nations. Uh, he was speaking of England, uh, and he explained that in England, the uh, what he called the principal architects of state policy are those who own the economy. Uh, in his day, that would be merchants and manufacturers. And as he said, they make sure that their own interests are uh, very uh, carefully served. Uh, whatever, however grievous the impact on others, uh, that sometimes includes the people of England, uh, but uh, particularly the victims of what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans uh, in their imperial domains. His primary concern, rightly, was the British and the Indian. Uh, uh, at that time, even in the early days of empire, very early days, the uh, British were uh, reducing Bengal to misery uh, from which it has yet to escape. Uh, it was uh, um, probably never will now uh, Bangladesh. Uh, this was uh, one of the richest and most productive areas of the world. It took very few years for it to be uh, devastated and virtually destroyed. Uh, other European powers uh, were doing much the same thing. The one case, still very much alive, is France, uh, which to this day continues to torture Haiti. Uh, France was richest colony, so one of the richest colonies in the world, the source of much of France as well. Uh, Haiti and uh, the ruins of Bengal, now Bangladesh, there are the very symbols of despair and hopelessness. Uh, the lessons are stark and clear, but invisible to imperial culture. And that's quite general. The, uh, noted the Harvard historian of empire, and Charles Meyer, uh, observes that empire could not exist without its intellectuals who take on the task of explaining that goals pursued for self-interest are in fact justified by progress. And we may add that they also have the task of uh, disappearing from the unpleasant reality. Uh, the Adam Smiths are exceptions. And what they say about these matters is scarcely known. Uh, everyone is supposed to worship Adam Smith, but not to read what he said, things like what I just mentioned. Well, Smith's observation is uh, virtual truism, but it's ignored in, in international relations theory. And when it's articulated, it's often regarded as scandalous. But it, uh, if we can overcome those barriers, it provides a rich insight into foreign policy. So by now, economic power has shifted into other hands, not merchants and manufacturers, but uh, multinational corporations, and particularly financial institutions. Now, they have expanded enormously in the past 30 years, and they have a decisive influence over policy formation uh, as we see regularly. And in very much as in earlier years, the masters uh, combined uh, eloquent pronouncements on free trade and small government with uh, crucial reliance on state power to protect themselves from the ravages of the market and to rescue them when their policies lead to disaster. That regular process is happening right before our eyes again today. Uh, and it's been going on for a long time and will continue as long as the institutional structures remain. Now throughout the reigning uh, socio-political system, socio-economic system, that uh, relies on the principle of uh, socialization of cost and risk uh, while profit is privatized. Now that's been a leading principle of economic history particularly dramatic in the United States since the Second World War. It has been uh, so sharply exposed to view in the past few years that the population is enraged, uh, though it's reacted in ways that are extremely irrational 
and have very dangerous implications in important matter that I'll have to put aside, although its impact on the United States and the world is likely to be severe. Uh, I did speak here a year ago, and I discussed uh, some of the interesting exceptions to uh, Adam Smith's maxim. Uh, what we sometimes find is that the parochial concerns of concentrated economic power are overridden by the state, which is concerned with their more general and long-term interests. One example that I didn't discuss was Iran, uh, and it's been an instructive case for a long time, and it's particularly important right now as the Iranian threat so-called has become the leading foreign policy issue in the West in the year of Iran. So going back a little, in 1953, the United States and Britain destroyed Iranian democracy with a military coup and installed the dictator, the Shah, a process all too familiar in Latin America, of course. But their motive was explicit. The uh, Iranian government the parliamentary government was seeking to gain control of Iran's huge uh, hydrocarbon resources. Uh, they were then in the hands of the British firm that is now called British Petroleum, BP. Uh, the firm had gained its extraordinary wealth primarily by robbing Iran, and it's now pursuing its location not very far from here again with grievous impact on others, as we all know too well. Uh, one of Washington's goals in 1953 was to transfer 40% of the British concession uh, in Iran into the hands of U.S. corporations. That was one component of a much broader uh, post-Second World War policy a program of expanding U.S. global domination while reducing Britain, formerly dominant power, to the role of a junior partner. Well, for reasons of short-term profit, uh, U.S. oil companies did not want to take the Iranian concession. Uh, but Washington forced them to do so with very credible threats. Uh, these threats were issued by political leaders who were hardly distinguishable from uh, oil and energy industry uh, executives, but now they were in their institutional role as state managers, and they were not acting out of concern for short-term gain, but rather for the broader, long-range interests of the whole corporate system, including the very same industries. Uh, so that is an exception to Smith's maxim, of which we, which we occasionally see. Actually, something similar has been happening uh, in recent years. Iran has taken control of its resources and it's seeking to act independently. Now that's the prime reason for the extreme U.S. hostility to Iran since the overthrow of the Shah in 1979. Now, Iran is open to investment by uh, foreign enterprises and U.S. corporations would no doubt be delighted to share in these opportunities, but they're barred by state policy, which seeks to overturn the Iranian regime and install one that is more compliant uh, to end the Iranian threat, as the goal is formulated in official terminology. Uh, just yesterday, one of the, the more prominent the senators, uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, called for the United States to bomb Iran unless it gives up its nuclear programs, but to carry out an extensive bombing, which would not just destroy nuclear facilities, but to lead to regime change, overthrow the government. And that's essentially the policy, even when it's not announced. Uh, but Washington has also imposed the harsh uh, extraterritorial extra conditions on financial uh, shipping and other industries. They limit the ability of the business classes in Europe and Japan to exploit these opportunities. Uh, one month ago, uh, the Obama administration warned international banks 
uh, that they face the risk of being shut out of the U.S. financial system if they do business with Iran, which is a very severe threat. Uh, by the standards that the West applies to others, these U.S. initiatives are literally acts of war. Uh, that was underscored in a proposal for what they call the New Grand Strategy that was issued by five high-level former NATO commanders uh, among the acts of war that they that call for no action on the part of the United States. As they said, the NATO commanders list abusing the leverage provided by weapons of financing. A very clear example of that is Obama's current actions against Iran. However, the commanders, of course, reflexively adopt conventional doctrine. Uh, acts of war can only be committed by enemies, by definition. Uh, in our hands, the very same measures are uh, righteous means of self-defense. So that's another near universal principle of international affairs, uh, just as the incapacity to perceive any of this is a near universal principle of the culture of the educated and privileged classes in the imperial states, and much as Charles Meyer pointed out. Well, Europe and Japan are not happy about being barred from Iranian resources and markets, but they have made the decision uh, to be vassals of the United States uh, rather than to pursue an independent path, as they surely could. In fact, that has been a constant concern of U.S. planners since World War II. Uh, similar concerns lie behind Washington's wars in Indochina, a very interesting topic that would carry us too far afield. Uh, that's incidentally one of the reasons for the functions of NATO is to try to prevent such developments today as well. Well, unlike Westerners, Iranians are well aware that Washington's torture of Iran has not ceased for half a century, over half a century. The first by imposing the rule of the Shah in 1953 and overthrowing the democratic system but particularly since 1979, when a popular uprising uh, overthrew the tyrant who the U.S. and Britain had imposed. Uh, immediately in 1979, uh, Washington tried to inspire a military coup to overthrow the new government that failed. Uh, then Washington turned to crucial support for Saddam Hussein the murderous aggression against Iran that cost Iran hundreds of thousands of lives. The attack uh, included weapons of mass destruction, uh, which took a fearful toll on the Iranians. And those are facts also not forgotten when Iran today considers the problem of deterrence. Uh, Saddam also turned these literally genocidal weapons against the Iraqi Kurds uh, while Reagan and company uh, chose to conceal what they knew uh, and blame the atrocities on Iran. Uh, the U.S. then intervened directly in the war uh, and effectively caused to tell Iran to capitulate. Uh, after the war, uh, the U.S. support for Saddam Hussein increased. Uh, Unfortunately, none of this, all of this is perfectly public, but never recorded and no commentary about it. So I'll just review it briefly. Immediately after the war, uh, President Bush, the first Bush president, he uh, invited Iraqi nuclear engineers to the United States for advanced training in nuclear weapons production. Uh, quite a threat to the brand. Uh, Shortly after that, in early 1990, he sent a high-level senatorial delegation to Iraq, led by Robert Dole, who was to be the Republican presidential candidate a few years later. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the delegation was sent 
to convey uh, the president's warm greetings to his good friend Saddam Hussein and to assure him that uh, he should ignore criticisms that are uh, produced by uh, irresponsible uh, U.S. journalists. A few months later, Saddam Hussein made his first error. He disobeyed or possibly misunderstood orders and they quite. Uh, from that moment, he switched instantly from great friend to the new Hitler, uh, plainly not because of his crimes, but rather his disobedience, uh, devastating bomb attacks destroyed much of Iraq. Uh, the population was then subjected to murderous sanctions, and then came the invasion uh, with consequences that I don't have to review. Well, Western opinion has, for the most part, preferred to understand very little of this. Uh, that was revealed dramatically uh, just a few weeks ago when Iraq agreed to pay $400 million to, quoting now, to Americans who say they were abused by Saddam Hussein's regime. Uh, we can barely calculate the colossal sums that the U.S. and Britain should pay to Iraqis uh, whom they abused. But that very thought is unthinkable. Uh, reports and commentary found nothing odd about the assignment of blame uh, in the West, that is, uh, uh, commenting on these issues in the Pakistani journal Dawn, which is a journal of the Western-oriented elite. Uh, and Mahir Ali wondered at the incapacity of Western commentators even to perceive their crimes, let alone take some responsibility for them. These sentiments are not uncommon outside the imperial culture, but within it, the barriers are overwhelming. They're virtually never heard. Well, meanwhile, the torture of Iran continued with harsh sanctions, a rejection of Iranian offers to negotiate all outstanding problems, and quite uh, a serious military threats increasing under President Obama. Uh, Right now, he's building up military forces in Iran, both in the Persian Gulf, but most significantly on the African island of Diego Garcia. Uh, the Britain had expelled all the inhabitants two years ago so that the United States could establish one of its major military bases, a base that's used regularly now for the bombing in the Middle East and for storage of nuclear weapons. Uh, Obama has recently expanded these facilities. He's dispatched uh, hundreds of uh, deep penetration bombs to Diego Garcia in Iran. Uh, no other purpose for them. And he's also set the support vessels for nuclear submarines, which target Iran, and potentially with nuclear weapons. Uh, all of this is defense against the dire Iranian threat. Uh, none of it reported. So a, few, a few days ago, Obama brought to Congress a bill for the largest arms sale in American history uh, to Saudi Arabia. The purpose, the press reported, is to box in Iran and incidentally to preposition weapons for the use of the U.S. military. It's a service provided as well by Israel. Uh, an incidental benefit is to recycle petrodollars to the ailing U.S. economy and to provide a huge boost to high-tech industry. Well, the proposed arms sale was reported, but not the rest of what I just reviewed. Uh, there was also, and there has been little notice of the fact that on this issue, the United States is becoming more isolated than Iran is. Uh, outside of Europe and Japan, there are very few feel obliged to follow Washington's orders. Uh, the non-aligned countries, who are most of the countries in the world and most of the population, uh, they have vigorously opposed U.S. policy towards Iran for years, again this month, under Egyptian leadership, when they produced an unusually forceful statement of support for 
Iranian nuclear policies, that coupled with criticism of the International Atomic Energy Agency for overstepping its authority with regard to Iran, and also reiteration of their condemnation of Israel's rejection of agency safeguards, as well as its rejection of the non-proliferation treaty itself under U.S. protection. And that just happened again yesterday. Uh, you can read it this morning's papers. Uh, but in uh, Western eyes, uh, uh, most of the world's population are what uh, British uh, diplomatic historian Mark Curtis calls unpeople. Uh, they are routinely dismissed. Uh, in the Arab world, the public opinion is so enraged by Western policies that a majority now even favor Iran's development of nuclear weapons as a counterweight and a deterrent to U.S.-Israeli power. That's, uh, that's actually nothing new. Uh, over 50 years ago, President Eisenhower commented on what he called the campaign of hatred against us in the Arab world, and not by governments, but by the people. Uh, public opinion, however, has not been of much concern to the United States and its allies. They have counted on friendly dictators uh, to control the population. That's an uncertain basis for policy, as the overthrow of the Shah illustrates, not the only case. Well, while imperial ideology routinely dismisses the insignificant people of the world, when matters get out of hand, uh, eyebrows are raised, tension begins to be focused, and that's beginning to happen. Uh, neighboring Iran, uh, two countries, Turkey and Pakistan, are constructing new pipelines to Iran. That's much to Washington's annoyance. Uh, Turkey's trade with Iran is increasing rapidly. They're very natural trading partners, with Turkey providing manufactured goods in return for Iranian hydrocarbons. Turkey has just announced that it's uh, Trade with Iran has jumped 86% in the first seven months of the U.S. declared year of Iran. And the Prime Minister of Turkey, uh, just a few days ago, uh, called on businessmen to triple trade volume with Iran within five years, making use of the opportunities provided by the U.S. sanctions, which are scaring off Western investors business press reports. Well, that's the neighborhood of Iran. Uh, turning elsewhere, Brazil is a rising power and perhaps at last on its way to becoming the Colossus of the, of the South, a counterweight to the Colossus of the North that was predicted by the business world a century ago. Brazil has outspokenly supported Iran's right to enrich uranium, soliciting harsh criticism from Washington. Uh, recently, as you know, Brazil joined Turkey in reaching an agreement uh, with Iran on uranium enrichment outside of Iran's borders. Uh, rather interesting, and reported that uh, President Obama had written to President Lula of Brazil supporting this effort. Uh, his letter to Lula says that, that Iran's agreement would build confidence and reduce regional tensions by substantially reducing Iran's low and rich uranium stockpile. Well, presumably, uh, Obama and his advisors assumed that the initiative would fail and that it would provide a propaganda weapon against Iran. Uh, however, it succeeded. And when it succeeded, the U.S. instantly reacted with extreme hostility and very quickly ran through a U.N. Security Council resolution that achieved far less than the Brazil-Turkey initiative, uh, but at least kept the matter under U.S. control very significant. Well, one state that's impossible to ignore is China. It may not be in the driver's seat as we read on the front cover of a prominent liberal 
Medical Journal this month. But it is powerful. It's confident and independent. It's returning to historical antecedents before what the Chinese call the century of humiliation at the hands of the imperial powers. Uh, China is expanding its uh, dominant role in Iran's energy industries. Uh, as the U.S. national press reports with alarm, uh, China's investors and traders are now filling a vacuum in Iran as businesses from many other nations, especially in Europe, pull out. The Chinese leaders are doubtless quite pleased with the toothless UN sanctions for this reason. And they vote for them in the Security Council while they continue to pursue their own commercial interests in Iran, just as Russia does. That's all consistent with U.S. sanctions, but not with the far more severe uh, unilateral U.S. sanctions. Uh, Washington is reacting to this breach of discipline with a touch of desperation. Uh, in August, the State Department warned China that if China, want, I'm quoting it, if China wants to do business around the world, it will also have to protect its own reputation. And if you acquire a reputation as a country that is willing to skirt and evade international responsibilities, that will have a long-term impact. China's international responsibilities are clear. The international responsibilities are to obey Washington's sanctions, its acts of war, which have no legitimacy whatsoever beyond what is conferred by power. And China's unlikely to be impressed by this demand. I rather suspect that the State Department warnings elicited some chuckles in the Chinese foreign ministry. They're certainly uh, reacting. Well, the desperation is reflected in political commentary as well. So in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago, two prominent conservative Iran specialists condemned uh, Washington's failure to punish Russia and China for what they called their subversiveness in failing to follow Washington's orders. Uh, all of this illustrates uh, that loss of control is a terrifying prospect for imperial managers. And there are other current illustrations. Uh, last month, the Pentagon released a study which expressed concern that China is expanding its military forces in ways, and according to the New York Times, in ways that could deny the ability of American warships to operate in international waters off the coast. That's off the coast of China, of course. Uh, Washington is concerned further, the report says, that China's lack of openness about the growth, capabilities, and intentions of its military inject, injects stability to a vital region of the globe, China's water. Uh, the U.S., in contrast, is quite open about its intention to operate freely throughout this uh, vital region of the globe surrounding China, as in fact everywhere else. Uh, it also advertises openly its vast capacity to do so with a growing military budget that roughly matches the rest of the world combined and to the military budget for next year is the biggest one since in real dollars since the Second World War. Uh, uh, hundreds of military bases abroad, uh, huge and growing lead in the technology of destruction and domination. Uh, also disturbing the U.S. leaders was China's objections to plans for the advanced uh, nuclear-powered aircraft carrier George Washington to join naval exercises a few miles off uh, China's coast, apparently with the capacity to strike Beijing with nuclear weapons. Uh, in China, 
all of this was widely reported. I happened to be there at the time, I was reading the English language newspapers. In the United States, there was little mention, and then only in the context of concerns over Chinese belligerence and its failure to honor the principle of freedom of the seas, which guarantees us the right to carry out naval maneuvers, threatening naval maneuvers uh, in, near, in China, near Chinese waters. Well, we can just imagine what the reaction would be if China were to carry out naval exercises in the Caribbean, deploying an advanced uh, nuclear power aircraft carrier with the capacity to strike Washington, uh, while also establishing forward deployment bases in, in nearby countries in the hemisphere. No need to comment. If that happened, the concerns about nuclear war could be put aside because we would have one. Uh, according to the same Pentagon study, another source of concern is the growth of China's military budget, which now, according to the Pentagon, is approaching one-fifth of what the Pentagon spends to operate and carry out the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which is, of course, a small fraction of the U.S. military budget. Well, these concerns are understandable on the virtually unchallenged assumption that the United States must maintain unquestioned power over much of the world with military and economic supremacy while ensuring the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by states that might interfere with its global designs. I'm quoting from the principles established by high-level planners, U.S. planners and foreign policy experts during World War II uh, as they developed the framework for the post-war world, uh, largely implemented in the years that followed. According to these principles, the United States was to dominate a grand area, uh, which was to include, at a minimum, the Western Hemisphere, uh, the Far East, and the former British Empire, that included the crucial energy uh, resources of the Middle East. It was always understood that uh, Europe might choose to follow an independent course, uh, perhaps uh, the Gaullist vision of a Europe from Atlantic to the Euros. That NATO, as I mentioned, was partially intended to counter uh, this threat, and the issue remains very much alive today. Uh, rather strikingly, as the Soviet, alleged Soviet threat collapsed, and NATO didn't disappear, as one might have been led to believe, reading the propaganda of the preceding 50 years. Instead, it expanded, immediately expanded to the east. It's now become a U.S.-run global intervention force uh, with uh, such tasks as controlling what's called the crucial infrastructure of the global energy system, pipelines, sea lanes, and so on, on which the West relies. Uh, all of this is held as necessary for the security of the United States and its allies. Uh, U.S. strategic analysts now describe the uh, Chinese military programs as posing what's called a classic security dilemma. I'm quoting now, whereby military programs and national strategies deemed defensive by their planners are viewed as threatening by the other side. It's Paul Goodman of the Foreign Policy Institute, formerly the West Point. Uh, so the U.S. Uh, deems its policies of controlling the seas off China's coast as defensive, but China regards them as threatening, while China regards its policies near its territory as defensive, while the U.S. regards them as threatening. That's a classic security dilemma. And it makes sense on the assumption that the U.S. has the right to control most of the world and that U.S. security requires something approaching absolute global control. And that's not a new principle. It's not even a post-Second World War principle. As I quoted, 
goes much further back. It's been a guiding principle of imperial policy for a long time. Uh, that principle was given a scholarly foundation in the first scholarly book on the roots of George W. Bush's uh, preventive war doctrine. This is by the distinguished Yale University historian John Lewis Gaddis. As he explains, uh, Bush was not doing anything new. He was relying on the principle that, in his words, expansion is the path to security. That's a doctrine that he traces admiringly back to the great grand strategist John Quincy Adams, who's the intellectual author of Manifest Destiny and the Monroe Doctrine. So when Bush warned that, quoting Gaddis, when Bush warned that Americans must be ready for preemptive action when necessary to defend their liberty and to defend their lives, he was echoing an old tradition rather than establishing a new one, reiterating principles that presidents from Adams to Woodrow Wilson would all have understood very well. And though he didn't mention it, Wilson's successors have also understood that very well. For example, Bill Clinton. Uh, his doctrine, official doctrine, quoted, was that the United States is entitled to use military force to ensure uninhibited access to key markets, energy supplies, and strategic resources. Uh, that's with no need even to concoct the pretexts of the George Bush variety. So the U.S. Doctrine continues, must therefore keep huge military forces forward deployed in Europe and Asia in order to shape people's opinions about us and to shape events that will affect our livelihood and our security. Uh, but world control is no simple matter, uh, even for a state with the unprecedented power of the United States. Uh, that power is eroding everywhere, uh, even in Washington's traditional backyards in Latin America. Here, the subjects are becoming increasingly disobedient. Uh, their steps towards independence advanced last February with the formation of the community of Latin American and Caribbean states that includes all states of the hemisphere, apart from the United States and Canada. That's a step beyond uh, UNASUR in South America and other independent institutions, but potentially that might displace the Organization of American States, which is U.S. dominated. And if these institutions function effectively, that will be no small matter for grand area principles. Now, President Nixon's uh, National Security Council was merely reiterating standard doctrine when they observed that if the United States cannot control Latin America, it cannot expect to achieve a successful order elsewhere in the world, meaning to control the world. Uh, interestingly, in the spirit of the Monroe Doctrine, Europe too had to be kept out of Latin America. The Nixon administration recognized, this is all of the time when they were planning to overthrow the Chilean government, uh, the Nixon administration recognized that bringing Europe in might be the best way to block potential Soviet influence, but they ruled out that option so as to, in their words, to prevent dilution of our political influence and loss of our markets for trade and investment. Well, those days are long gone. Uh, last year, China overtook the United States to become Brazil's biggest trading partner. So this year, it's likely to become the biggest investor in Brazil. These uh, growing economic ties uh, throughout the continent and deep much of the South are what the business press calls among the enduring symbols of shifts in the global economy. Western Asia, the Middle East, with its huge energy resources, is an even greater concern for planners than Latin America. That's the largest hydrocarbon reserves in the world are in Saudi Arabia. That's been a U.S. dependency 
ever since World War II when the United States displaced Britain there in a mini war it conducted during, during World War II. Uh, the U.S. remains by far the largest investor in Saudi Arabia and it's its major trading partner, but that's changing. By now, more than half of Saudi oil exports go to Asia and its growth plans are facing east. The same may be true, may turn out to be true, of the country with the second largest uh, reserves of Iraq. Uh, if it can reconstruct from the massive destruction of the murderous uh, U.S.-British sanctions and then the invasion. And U.S. policies are driving Iran, the third major producer, in the same direction. Uh, overall, China is now the largest importer of Middle East oil and the larger, largest exporter to the region, replacing the United States. Uh, trade relations are growing fast. They've doubled in the past five years. And the implications for world order are quite significant, as is the quiet rise of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, includes much of Asia, but bans the United States. Uh, potentially, it's uh, a new energy cartel involving both producers and consumers, including international economist Stephen King, and uh, some believe it might be a counterpart to NATO. Well, one serious potential conflict over resource control has so far been discussed only in the technical literature. That by geological accident, China currently produces more than 97% of rare earths. These are essential components for advanced electronics and particularly for green technology, uh, green energy technology. Uh, in the Journal of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, read that uh, China is cutting exports, which could, they say, ground fledgling efforts to build clean energy industries in the United States and other Western countries. And in the business press, you read that U.S. investors and banks are turning towards China, where green technology investment from the United States uh, uh, where, uh, uh, is greater than the Europe and the United States combined. And Europe, incidentally, is far ahead of the United States in developing the technology of the future. Uh, U.S. executives say that if Congress doesn't hurry, uh, green technology is going to be developed in China, where choices are determined not by short-term gain, uh, as in the more market-oriented economies, and there's no institutional pressure, as there is in the United States, to ignore what are called externalities, that is, the effect of a transaction on others. Uh, there are such pressures in market systems. Uh, ignoring such externalities has been a primary cause of the repeated financial crises of the years since regulation was abandoned 30 years ago. And it's far more than when the externalities ignored or denied that include the prospects for decent human survival. And that's the situation we're facing now. Now these, however, are not the issues highlighted or even mentioned in political commentary. Rather, attention is focused on the dire Iranian threat. Uh, incessant, incessant propaganda has significantly influenced opinion on the severity of the threat. By now, about two-thirds of Americans would accept the use of military force if diplomacy does not end the Iranian threat. And I mentioned Senator Graham's uh, statement yesterday. The threat has been far less true of Europeans, but even there it's over 40% affected by the same propaganda. Well, those who are curious might ask exactly what is the Iranian threat? Actually, we have an authoritative answer to that, provided by U.S. military and intelligence in their annual reports to Congress, latest one in April 2010. Of course, they discuss Iran. Uh, they make clear that the Iranian threat is not military. 
military spending, they say, Iran's military spending, they say, is relatively low compared to the rest of the region. Its military doctrine is strictly defensive, designed to slow an invasion and force a diplomatic solution to hostilities. Iran, they say, has only a limited capability to project force beyond its borders. They discuss the nuclear issue. And with regard to this, they say that Iran's nuclear program and its willingness to keep open the possibility of developing nuclear weapons is a central part of its deterrent strategy. Well, the brutal clerical regime in Iran is doubtless a threat to its own people, though it doesn't rank particularly high in that respect in comparison to U.S. allies in the region. But that's not what concerns the military and the intelligence assessments. Uh, there, they made it clear it was a threat, but not a military threat, but nevertheless an ominous one. Uh, one element of the threat, in fact, is Iran's potential deterrent capacity. That is an illegitimate exercise of sovereignty, like China's efforts to control its own wars. It might interfere with U.S. freedom of action in the region. In particular, U.S. control over uh, Middle East energy resources. That's been a very high priority of planners since World War II. One influential planner of Roosevelt and later administrations advised that uh, control of these resources yields substantial control of the world. Uh, but Iran's threat goes beyond deterrence. It's also seeking to expand its influence in neighboring countries and this way to destabilize the region. That's the technical terms of foreign policy discourse, much as China is increasing instability uh, by de uh, developing its military budget to one-fifth the level of what the U.S. spends in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, uh, the, uh, Iran's efforts to extend its influence in neighboring countries is called destabilization and it's truly illegitimate. Uh, incidentally, that's standard usage. So, for example, a prominent foreign policy analyst, James Chase, was using the term stability properly in its technical sense when he wrote that in order to achieve stability in Chile, it was necessary to destabilize the country by overthrowing the Allende government and installing the Pinochet dictatorship. Uh, other concerns that are raised that are equally interesting to explore, but perhaps that's enough to reveal something about the guiding principle and their status in imperial culture. Well, let me turn finally to the global shift of power. That's a prominent theme of contemporary discourse on international affairs. Uh, there's a lot of speculation about uh, whether or when China might displace the United States as the dominant global power, uh, along with India. If that happened, it would mean that the global system would be returning to something like what it was before the European conquests. And in fact, their recent economic growth has been measured by GDP, gross domestic product, uh, has indeed been spectacular. Uh, but there's a lot more to say. Uh, in the uh, United Nations Human Development Index, uh, India retains its place near the bottom, slightly above Cambodia, below Laos and Tajikistan. Uh, China is slightly higher in 92nd place, uh, a bit above Jordan, below the Dominican Republic and Iran. Uh, India and China also suffer from extremely high inequality. So that means well over a billion of their inhabitants, probably close to two billion, fall far lower in the scale. In India, since the neoliberal reforms were instituted 20 years ago, the percentage of undernourished rural households has increased, and the consumption of food grains by the average household has significantly declined. Uh, more than 150 150,000 peasant suicides have been officially recorded. Uh, in fact, probably many more than that. 
uh, mostly they are a result of debt uh, as the government services to the vast rural majority have declined. That's one aspect of the neoliberal programs. I mean, you're elsewhere too. You're too. Uh, India is planning to have what they call a knowledge society, and that's indeed grown. But 40% of children in India do not even attend school. The World Bank estimates per capita income in India to be about 2% of the United States, about 5% in China, very somewhat depending on measures, but not much. Uh, furthermore, an accurate accounting would go beyond conventional measures to include very serious costs that China and India cannot long ignore the ecological resource depletion labor rights, which are miserable, and others. Uh, all of the speculations about the shift of global power overlook something that we all should understand very well. Uh, nations, states, divorced from the internal distribution of power are not the only actors in international affairs, or even the major ones. And rather, the principal actors are the sectors that dominate the domestic economy. Adam Smith's truism again. Well, bearing this radical truism in mind, we can see that there is indeed a global shift of power, but not the one that occupies center stage. It's a shift from the global workforce to transnational capital. It's been sharply escalating during the neoliberal years. The cost is substantial. That includes American workers who are victims of the financialization of the economy and export of production. They've been able to maintain incomes for the past 30 years only by uh, debt and uh, asset bubbles, such as the $8 trillion housing bubble that just collapsed. It includes starving peasants in India. It includes millions of growing work as of uh, protesting workers in China. China labor share and national income is declining even more rapidly than most of the world. It includes Mexicans fleeing the impact of NAFTA, which has done more harm to Mexico than Spanish colonialism did, according to the Farmers Confederation, with a loss of over 2.3 million jobs in agriculture, while over half of the new jobs that were created do not meet basic standards and it includes all too many others around the world. Well, China plays a role in the real global shift of power, the one I just mentioned. It's now functioning largely as an assembly plant for the advanced Asian economies, uh, part of a regional production system. Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, advanced Asian economies, they export parts and components to mainland China and they provide much of the advanced technology uh, China assemblies using low-cost labor. Now, there's been a lot of concern about the growing U.S. trade deficit with China, but less notice is the fact that the trade deficit with Japan and the rest of Asia has very sharply declined as the new regional production system takes shape. Uh, international economists estimate that if only the value added by manufacturers in China were counted, the real U.S.-China trade deficit would reduce by about 30 percent, while the U.S. trade deficit with Japan would arise by about the same amount. Uh, U.S. manufacturers are following the same course. They're providing parts and components for China to assemble and export and much of the advanced technology, including the green technology investments, which I mentioned, the export is mostly back to the United States. Now, for the financial institutions and the retail clients of giants, let's say Walmart, and for ownership and management of manufacturing industries, and for sectors closely related to this nexus of power, these developments are heavenly. Uh, not, however, for the majority of the people in the richest and most powerful country in the world, the United States. Their incomes have stagnated for 30 years. 
uh, in, the middle, in the midst of staggering concentration of wealth and collapse of support systems and infrastructure. All of this is leading to ominous domestic developments, as I mentioned, and there are similar manifestations in Europe and elsewhere. It's also worth taking note of the demographic factors that underlie China's spectacular economic growth. And these were studied recently by China scholar Wang Feng, and he estimates that about one-fifth of the economic growth is attributable to what's called the demographic dividend. That roughly means the ratio of producers to consumers. The period of uh, rapid economic growth coincided with the availability of a young and productive labor force. And that he observes is a non-repeatable historical phenomenon. Uh, that favorable demographic dividend is now beginning to disappear. And in fact, it will soon reverse the sharply. Uh, the size of the population in the crucial young worker range, 2030, uh, that's going to undergo a precipitous drop in the next decade, reducing by about 25%. And that tendency is expected to continue. Uh, there will be significant effects not only on labor productivity, but also on social life. Uh, the impact will be particularly severe for the growing elderly population. They will not be able to count on children for voting for emotional and physical and financial support, as had traditionally been the case. And they have only very weak institutional structures to fill the gap, at least partially. Uh, in addition, the uh, impact of the sex selection under the one child policy, illegal but constant. Now that has led to an excess of 30 million males or the females under 20. But that's also expected to have severe effects on an increasingly fragile society. Well, all of these are factors to bear in mind when we read the reports about China's taking over the world in the driver's seat. Uh, exaggerations aside, the shifts of power relations are nevertheless real. The world is indeed becoming more diverse. There's a broader distribution of power and a growing share of industrial production, which sort of really matters in the dynamic Asia region. One of the most serious studies of these developments by international economist Stephen King quoted earlier uh, the book has the title, Losing Control, the Emerging Threats to Western Prosperity. Now, the title is that, and the threat of losing control goes far beyond the economic destiny to which he restricts attention. Control, much more broadly, is the dominant theme of imperial history. Given a number of examples. And furthermore, the simplest calculations show that per capita income in the Asian giants cannot approach that of the West without destroying the world unless there's a significant decline in Western prosperity as it is conventionally measured. And that latter qualification is significant. It's long been understood that the conventional use of gross domestic product to measure economic growth is highly misleading. There have been efforts to construct more realistic measures. One of them is called the General Progress Indicator. It, it subtracts expenditures that increase gross domestic product but harm the public, such as the Gulf oil spill, which is contributing to U.S. gross domestic product but partly beneficial. Uh, they also subtract crime and tra tra traffic accidents and other uh, events that increase domestic products that are harmful. And they add the estimated values of authentic benefits, such as volunteer work, leisure, and so on. Now, in the United States, uh, the general pro progress indicator has stagnated since the 1970s, although gross domestic product has increased of the growth going into very few pockets. Now that result correlates 
with others. And for example, the study of social indicators, which are the standard measure of health of the society, and they tracked economic growth until the mid-1970s in the United States. Then they began to decline. Uh, they reached the level of 1960 by 2000. That's the latest figures available. They're surely lower today. The correlation with uh, financialization of the economy and neoliberal socioeconomic measures is hard to miss, and it's quite general. Latin America is a well-known case in point. Uh, in general, it's far from clear that prosperity, in any sense meaningful to human life, is measured by the number of commodities within reach and the amount of fossil fuel that one can consume. And serious contemplation of these matters leads to far-reaching conclusions about the organization of human life and about cultural priorities, a topic that cannot be put off too long if there is to be any hope for decent survival. Lightly as usual. 
but I'll return to the nature of the Iranian threat as it's officially formulated uh, and to what that uh, teaches us about how policies are formulated and uh, implemented and about the efforts to uh, make the future uh, actually teaches us quite a lot, I think. First, some background comments. Uh, while alleged threats come and go, uh, depending on need, the basic principles of uh, policy formation are quite stable. Uh, one fundamental principle was outlined by Adam Smith in his uh, 18th century. Well, I'm very pleased to uh, be able to participate in the uh, uh, centenary uh, celebrations, uh, auspicious occasion, and uh, an honor and a pleasure to be able to take part in it. Uh, in discussing uh, problems of the future, there are two issues that are so overwhelming that uh, no uh, approach to these matters can ignore them totally. I'm not going to say much about them. Uh, one is the problem of environmental destruction, uh, which is approaching uh, we see in aspects of it regularly. Uh, the second is the problem of nuclear war, uh, constantly a dark cloud ever since 1945, and the problem is not getting, uh, is not approaching solution. Uh, there were two major conferences last year, international conferences, uh, attempting to address these problems. One in Copenhagen on the environment was complete failure. Uh, another, the uh, uh, regular nuclear posture review, nuclear proliferation treaty review last May, which also got nowhere. Uh, right now, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency is meeting uh, to try to deal with problems of proliferation. You can take a look at this morning's newspaper. You can find that true classic, the uh, Wealth of Nations. Uh, he was speaking of England, uh, and he explained that in England, the uh, what do you call it, the principal architects of state policy are those who own the economy. Uh, in his day, that would be merchants and manufacturers. And as he says, they make sure that their own interests are uh, very uh, carefully served. Uh, whatever, however grievous the impact on others, uh, that sometimes includes the people of England, uh, but uh, particularly the victims of what he called the savage injustice of the Europeans uh, in their imperial domains. His primary concern, rightly, was the British and India. Uh, uh, at that time, even in the early days of empire, very early days, the uh, British were uh, reducing Bengal to misery, uh, from which it has yet to escape. Uh, it was uh, um, probably never will now Bangladesh. Uh, the, this was a, one of the richest and most productive areas of the world. It took very few years for it to be devastated and virtually destroyed. Uh, other European powers uh, were doing much the same thing. The one case, still very much alive, is France, uh, which to this day continues to torture Haiti. Uh, France's richest colony, so one of the richest colonies in the world, the source of much of France's wealth, uh, Haiti, and uh, the ruins of Bengal, now Bangladesh, they are the very symbols of despair and hopelessness. Uh, the lessons are stark and clear, but invisible to imperial culture. And that's quite general. The uh, noted uh, Harvard historian of empire, uh, Charles Meyer, uh, observes that empire could not exist without its intellectuals who take on the task of explaining that goals pursued for self-interest are in fact justified by progress. And we may add that they also have the task of uh, disappearing the unpleasant reality. 
Uh, the Adam Smiths are exceptions, and what they say about these matters is scarcely known. That uh, everyone is supposed to worship Adam Smith, but not to read what he said, things like what I just mentioned. Well, Smith's observation is uh, virtual truism, but it's ignored in, in international relations theory. And when it's articulated, it's not often regarded as scandalous. But it, uh, if we can overcome those barriers, it provides a rich insight into foreign policy. So by now, economic power has shifted into other hands, not merchants and manufacturers, but uh, multinational corporations, and particularly financial institutions. Now, they have expanded enormously in the past 30 years, and they have a decisive influence over policy formation, 